So I approached uh, Root Ridge with a, a book proposal based on the previous three uh, symposia. They were very interested in, uh, in our idea uh, of publishing an edited book uh, from the symposium, the pa symposium papers, uh, particularly because uh, uh, there is a lack of development uh, uh, books by Asian uh, academics and uh, researchers, uh, not much. Eh? Uh, but they want uh, more papers uh, before they make a decision. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, they generously offered uh, the award, uh, which I believe is a strong encouragement uh, of uh, our plan and uh, ambition. Uh, and that's how we get the Rutriji Award. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, all of you to contribute to uh, uh, our project uh, uh, which is uh, very important uh, uh, for the sustainability, as I emphasized in the morning, uh, very important uh, for the sustainability of uh, this uh, uh, symposium and uh, our community. Uh, you can contribute in two ways, uh, uh, directly by submitting a chapter. So um, some of you are locked in already. <laughs> and uh, secondly, indirectly, I will send uh, each of you a paper for review. That is, uh, you can contribute by serving as a reviewer, particularly by providing critically constructive or constructively critical comments, uh, <laughs> like I did my colleague, uh, the Dr. <laughs> Yi Jin Young, this morning. Uh, now, <coughs> finally, I announce uh, the prize winner. Uh, in this kind of uh, uh, announcement, uh, everybody said the decision was uh, very difficult. Uh, Huh? <laughs> because of uh, many uh, competitive papers, uh, uh, which is a uh, cliche, but it is not cliche. Yes, uh, it is the same uh, the case, uh, the case with our case. Uh, uh, it was very, uh, we had a very hard time to select uh, uh, as among very competitive uh, papers. So, uh, yeah, another cliche in Korea is uh, the before we announce uh, <laughs> uh, the winner is. Uh, The winner is uh, uh, the Tristan Canaria, the Jamil Paolo, uh, Francisco, and Joseph Fernando Morales, uh, uh, firm creation and uh, ease, ease and the cost of doing business. Uh, please uh, come forward. Uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee and uh, Kaidek. Uh, one more thing, okay. Special announcement. And uh, uh, before I close the, this ceremony, uh, I'd like to make an announcement uh, or sort of uh, marketing campaign. Uh, we Kaidek has uh, our uh, house journal. Uh, named the International Development and Cooperation Review. Uh, we are in the process of uh, revamping, uh, revamping the journal as is <coughs> revamping the journal or uh, sort of uh, recreating it. Uh, in a word, uh, we will develop uh, into an international journal uh, from a sort of purely the domestic one. Uh, so uh, <coughs> this is the new uh, cover. Uh, we are going to changing the makeup, all, all those things. Uh. So uh, please uh, submit your paper to our journal uh, in, 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 the, in the future, please. Uh. And uh, it is published. Uh, 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 yeah, you can uh, submit any paper other than uh, your the papers in this symposium or it is also possible you can uh, submit uh, a paper into our journal 
Uh, then we can later uh, publish it in a book chapter, which is uh, acceptable practice uh, as far as I understand. Uh, and uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Kim, uh, who, who is in charge of the journal, uh, editor-in-chief, uh, editor uh, will help you by uh, fast tracking as, uh, as far as I understand. Uh, so uh, uh, we, and, uh, we also invite uh, some of you to the editorial board. Uh, so uh, thank, uh, if uh, he approaches you, please accept uh, our invitation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you for your uh, the contribution in advance. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Lee, and congratulations, Dr. Hamil Francisco. Enjoy your prize. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, we are now halfway of our program today and to start with let me give you a brief introduction of our session session chair for the topic development issues in ASEAN countries okay our, our chair for the second session is a professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at the Yonsei University in Korea before joining the university he was a faculty member of the Department of Information Systems at the University of Melbourne in Australia and Brunel University in the UK. He also served as a working committee member of the Committee for International Development Cooperation in the Prime Minister's Office from 2012 to 2016. His areas of research include information and, community and communication technology for development and standardization and innovation deve deve in developing countries. Uh, once again, may we um, hear from uh, Dr. Hee Jin Lee. Uh, th <laughs> thank you very much. Eh? Now we will uh, uh, begin with the second session titled uh, Development Issues in ASEAN Countries. Uh, but as I said, there are some uh, changes in the program. So <coughs> uh, there is a swap between uh, uh, Dr. The King Ko Kao and uh, with the, the Dr. Uh, Pam Dui Tuk, right? So. Uh <coughs> The first uh, the paper uh, to be presented, uh, supposed to be presented today, will be presented tomorrow. And uh, uh, <laughs> the, the we have uh, one from the uh, tomorrow's session. And uh, uh, so the we have three the presentations to today. The first one is uh, uh, the Mr. Jamil Paulos and uh, San uh, Francisco on the awarded paper. And the second one will be uh, Ms. Joan Hee, uh, is it here? Yep, yep, uh, Joan Hee, uh, from uh, Philippine uh, La Salle University. And the third one will be, uh, as I just said, uh, Dr. Pam Dui uh, Tuk uh, from Vietnam. And uh, <coughs> we have three. In fact, uh, in, uh, in the program, we have three uh, uh, discussions, uh, but by having the uh, paper from tomorrow's session, uh, we also invited uh, uh, one discussant, uh, which, who is uh, Dr. Francis Kumba. Uh, he generously agreed <coughs> to uh, uh, make a comment uh, today and tomorrow, right? <laughs> and now uh, I invite uh, the, the Dr. The Jamil Paolo uh, Francisco uh, to make a presentation on his awarded paper. <laughs> 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 creation and the ease and the cost of doing business. Uh, so by having the ceremony in f in uh, f uh, first, uh, so you will be scrutinized I by know, our exactly. colleagues. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are also committee <coughs> members are scrutinized. <laughs> Please do the Thank you very much. Uh, that <laughs> So as 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 uh, Dr. Lee had had just mentioned, <laughs> this, this this puts undue pressure, I think, on the presentation. Um, uh, and of course, I will apologize right away. Give an apology that the primary author is not with us today to help share the the, the findings of the result. That's my excuse for a bad presentation that will ensue for now. <laughs> Anyhow, so I will try my best to um, describe the results of the study. Uh, and, and, and try to look at the relevance of this to us. Um, originally, when uh, I heard about this, this conference, uh, the, the, the topic that, w that I wanted to cover was really about strategies, ASEAN strategies of companies. 
but we realized that because of certain like uh, publication legal things, I, I could not present something that has obviously already been published. So we came up with something, one of our working papers, and uh, graciously the organizers accepted to present this paper. And I think that that's fortunate for us, I suppose, that uh, that they liked it. Um, Coming from this morning's discussion, I realize, however, that there's a huge shift uh, with this session, and in particular in, my, in this paper, because coming from issues that are very macroeconomic, in fact, not just at a national level, but a regional level, in fact, at a global <laughs> continent, like a global level, all of a sudden now I'm going to be talking about small and medium and sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, this is creation in. Uh, the sub-national level. Um, I made a slip there called small and medium enterprise and some of the co my, my friends here at PIDS are smiling because the previous paper that I presented a few months ago was on small and medium enterprise and that's the bulk of this, the work that I'm doing now. Um, anyhow, uh, just the other day I had a former student come to my office. Uh, he's a real estate um, economist. I didn't even know that existed, right? Uh, that basically he does research uh, for real estate companies to look at forecasts and whatnot. Um, and he was talking about competitiveness. And he came to my office to talk about what it means for the Philippines to be competitive. Is the Philippines competitive? How does that affect the real estate industry? And I tried to give him a few details as to what I think competitiveness was made about. And he sort of summarized it at the end. And he said, oh, so sir, what you really just mean is that competitiveness is about everything which GDP, interest rates, inflation does not account for, meaning everything else. Um, and there's some truth to that. Uh, there are many ways by which you try to measure competitiveness, but if you look at the literature, one of the usual measures of competitiveness has to do with the ease and cost of doing business. So in that sense, this paper is very basic in that what we're trying to see is uh, does a measure of competitiveness, and in this case proxied by the ease and cost of doing business, actually have that expected effect on firm creation or the number of firms being put up um, in the subnational level in different cities and municipalities? And that's what this paper is basically about. So, of course, why do we monitor and measure competitiveness? So again, uh, an, an apology. So I come from a policy center for competitiveness, so we're obsessed in it, <laughs> right? We're obsessed in competitiveness. But why do we have to worry about competitiveness, especially in this context when we're talking about international development cooperation? That might be a huge question in our minds, right? Um, of course, the issue of competitiveness is about picking a winner. This is about pick me rather than someone else. Okay, I guess there's a subtext now. <laughs> um, that wasn't intentional. But, <laughs> but, the idea is, yeah, yeah. but the idea is pick me instead of somebody else. Um, of course, uh, development cooperation does not always have to be a win-lose situation. Right? But at the end of the day, and especially if you go on the ground, it is about do you pick this municipality or another? Not even just do you pick this country or another. Right? It also goes down to the level of do you pick this company or the other as a business partner. And these are the things that we have to worry about. Um, and the competitiveness of firms has in many ways, of course, related to the competitiveness of localities and the competitiveness of countries. So it's important for us to look at competitiveness. And the only way that economic uh, progress could actually prosper and trickle down, so to speak, to the lowest levels um, of the economy is to make sure that competitiveness is not studied and developed just in terms of nations, but also in terms of down to the smaller level, whether it's firms or in this case of municipalities and cities. Um, as I had mentioned, the ease of doing business, uh, which generally would mean uh, how easy is it to get permits, right? How easy is it to get government accreditation, right? Uh, construction permits, sanitary permits, and the like. Um, has been used as a measure of competitiveness. But so too has been the cost of doing business, which typically involves the cost of, let's say, electricity, of rent, of commercial space. And we use that as a proxy here for competitiveness, at least in an abstract fashion. Okay? 
but what we're actually measuring empirically is in terms of simply ease and cost of doing business. I'll go a little bit into the details of the, 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 va the variables or indicators we actually use. Now, um, why does it matter if firms are not created or are not uh, built in cities or municipalities? Well, uh, the literature, of course, tells us that if cities or municipalities where the firms are supposed to be created are not competitive, that can result in these negative effects, obviously lower FDI. Sure, uh, firms coming into different countries to make direct investments choose countries. But the next step after choosing the country is where in the country will you set up shop? Is it if in the Philippines? Is it in Subic? Is it in Clark? Is it in Metro Manila? Is it in Laguna? Is it in Quezon City? Right? And so the question of FDI right, also goes down to the local level. So if for some reason it is difficult to set up shop in a particular locality, that affects FDI nationally, not just regionally or, or locally. Um, obviously, it also affects fa factor productivity. Right, which affects the nation as a whole. Uh, it affects the technological growth, um, both at the macro and the local level. Um, and if we're talking about development, we cannot not talk about the informal sector. Uh, the informal sector happens in these locales. So if a locale is not competitive, then what tends to happen is that the economy still has to go on. People still need their food on the table. Economic activity still has to happen. But if a, a locale is not competitive enough to attract foreign, uh, sorry, formal businesses, then the informal sector will tend to be more prevalent in that area with all of its challenges with regard to development. And then finally, when uh, the creation of firms is difficult at the local level, this discourages entrepreneurship. And increasingly, we understand in developing countries, uh, entrepreneurship is a critical component of uh, inclusive development. So for this study, we tried to use subnational Philippine data um, and take a look at the effect of ease and cost of doing business on firm creation. In particular, we used data from the National Competitiveness Council, which is a uh, quasi a private public uh, partnership, if you want, which uh, compiles data right, and does studies on competitiveness. So they have this data set of the Cities and Municipalities Competitiveness Index, or I will refer to now as CMCI. Um, it was launched in 2014, but with data beginning in 2011. So what we did is we used this data, which looks at several indicators of the cities and municipalities all over the Philippines, and tried to see uh, what we can find there. Um, the CMCI has three main pillars. It looks at economic dynamism, uh, growth, right, uh, population, etc. Government efficiency, which looks at ease of doing business, number of days to do a permit, etc., and infrastructure. Not very different from the pillars that, that are commonly used in competitiveness rankings, whether it's WCY or GCR. Now, the focus of the study had been on two sub-pillars. So the sub-pillar of cost of doing business under economic dynamism, and the sub-pillar of business registration efficiency under government efficiency. Under each sub-pillar, there are 19, sorry, under both sub-pillars in total, there are 19 indicators. Uh, uh, which we listed down also in the paper now, which represent the ease and cost of doing business. And these are those costs, for those of you interested. Um, in the terms of cost of doing business, these are the indicators, cost of electricity, cost of water, price of diesel, uh, the minimum wage, the cost of land in a central business district, and the cost of rent. I think it's self-explanatory why we have these as the cost indicators. And of course, this is based also on the data that is available. In terms of uh, ease of doing business, these are the eight uh, indicators that we used. Number of days it takes to get the permit for a new business. Number of steps it takes to get the permit for a new business. Number of days and steps for business permit renewal. And number of days and steps to get a build building permit. Um, of course, the theoretical framework here Apologies, for I, I, I realize it's an academic crowd I'm talking to. <laughs> it's not on my slide because I'm used to talking with uh, uh, practitioners nowadays, um, but it's in the paper. So the, the, the theoretical framework basically that we have is, of course, if you are a would-be entrepreneur, your decision falls under the, this, this, this notion of do I continue with my regular source of wage employment or do I set up my own business? 
Um, but obviously now there's a cost to setting up that business. So the only reason that you would go ahead and set up a new shop uh, or a new business is if the um, startup costs associated with putting up a new business uh, is greater than the difference between the expected income from a new business versus the income from wages. But what makes up that startup cost, right? Part of that cost is the actual capital expenses and whatnot, but part of it also is the time delay. Because the longer time that you have a delay between giving up your job and starting the business and running it, that's income foregone. So both the actual cost and you know the steps it takes to let the business run become important costs for the entrepreneur. Okay, so uh, we use three indices basically here um, just to make sure that our, our, our results are robust. So um, the first index is called the cost and ease index. So what we do here is we simply develop an index using the 19 indicators that we have. So we standardized all of the, in the, uh, the indicators and got the average for the five years. Because we didn't treat it as, uh, as panel data or, or time series. We treated it as just what is the average for those five years, 2011 to 2015. Um, and that is our cost ease index. Uh, the cost index is uh, derived in a similar fashion, but without the ease of business indicators. So that we just focus on the, uh, the cost, the actual uh, money out costs for uh, setting up a new business. Uh, the ease index is the opposite. We remove the costs and only look at the number of days, number of permits. Um, and then, of course, we tried to control. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we tried to control for other factors, which include the size and characteristics of the local economy, uh, because of the lack of data with regards to individual city and municipality gross domestic product. We use a proxy. In particular, we use total tax collection. Uh, in, in, in those cities from corporate, uh, from commercial uh, sources. Um, and we also use some control factors for governance. Namely, this include, uh, number one, what is the ratio between the locally sourced revenue versus the total revenue of the city or municipality? Um, that is a, uh, a signal or a proxy, if you want, for the uh, independence of your city or municipality relative to the uh, central government. And this is a particularly interesting governance indicator for us now because as you may know, the Philippines um, is studying or going through this process of converting per perhaps to federalism. Um, another governance indicator we used is the uh, existence of a local investor code. Um, and the, th the third is a local investor incentive mechanism. Yeah. And obviously we regress this now on the number of new business registrations. So uh, just to mi enrich the, the analysis, we did the analysis first for all cities and municipalities in that index, and then for cities only, and then for the third to sixth class municipalities, which mean the low income municipalities. And here are the results. This is the slide that we always skip when we talk to uh, <laughs> uh, the audience that I regularly uh, um, present to, but I guess this is the slide which excites all of the <laughs> the economists and the academics in here. Um, so let me go to the next slide where I look at the results and what it means. Okay. So basically, as you know, okay, so I'll go to one, two, three, four, five, six. So I do have one, two, three, four, five. It's actually, I think there's a, the, if you have a copy of the, the, the paper, this is actually a bigger, a longer table. So I apologize why it's, uh, it's shorter here, right? Because we looked at, again, your, we regressed your number of new business registered to uh, either of the indices and then the control variables, which includes population, business tax, inflation, and their governance indicator. So I apologize that it's not here. Um, but for all of our runs, uh, the R squared is about 86, point eighty six point eighty seven. so I think it this is a, it's a pretty good explanation. Um, and I think we've, of course, tested for all of those multicollinearity and whatnot. So I think we did our homework. Um, and here are some of our findings. Um, this is obvious. <laughs> the overall ease and cost of doing business has had a positive and significant relationship, as, as denoted by those uh, asterisks, um, for business creation. That makes absolute sense. Okay. Um, 
what it becomes more interesting though when we have the disaggregated ones when we look for example at just cost or just ease of doing business when you look at just the cost of doing business it also has a positive effect on business creation for all cities and municipalities but if you look at just ease of doing business it has no significant effect for practitioners this is a surprise and when i present this to business people they'll say of course not and of course as an academic you'll say oh maybe i did something wrong <laughs> because for business people the primary concern has always been it's the number of days of the permit in fact even you know administrations this and in the past one of their biggest um, pushes has been to reduce the number of days or steps for a permit from five to four to three right it becomes almost pedantic that is it does it make a difference if it's five or four days and a half or whatnot right but it seems that there is no significant effect here um, when you're looking at this data if you're looking at just ease of doing business of course you would understand now that if you go back to the first argument that argument is that when you combine the two that's when it becomes significant Right? Because on its own, if you think about it, the number of days lost, that doesn't make much sense. But if you factor that in now with the cost, then it becomes significant. Um, again, we were just playing around with the data. So uh, uh, aside from that approach of creating an index, we said, why not try to regress it individually using individual indicators? And individually on their own, all of these um, indices right, show that um, basically, the minimum wage, cost of electricity, cost of water, etc., right, drive the effect of the cost. And in the case of uh, ease of doing business, it's the number of days to apply for this new business permit that is most important. Um, as expected, for the control variables, most measures of the size of the economy and demand are positive and significant. Uh, sorry. There you go. Um, when we looked at just the cities, the cities only, they have same results, except that the coefficients are much larger. So the impact of ease and cost of doing business is much larger for cities. Here's the interesting part also about the lower class municipalities with the lower incomes. Um, no individual indicator of ease and or cost of doing business was significant in firm creation. Um, what mattered were the size of the economy uh, and indicators of demand and some indicators of governance. Um, we don't want to read too much in this, but we would want to say, however, this, that it seems that for the poorest of cities and municipalities, whether or not you cut the number of days to come up with a new business or not, or whether the cost of risk or whatever goes down or whatnot, that has almost no effect. It's, it might be simply for the reason that, you know, everything else, in that area is just below a certain threshold in the minds of business people that they don't even consider going there at all. Whether that be the size of the economy, it's just simply too small. The city is too small. The town is too small, right? Um, interestingly, when we look at governance, though, a particular indicator, the indicator about having a local uh, investor uh, incentive code, that turned out to be significant. Okay, so some implications. Um, of course, with regards to overall ease and cost of doing business, that's pretty much expected. Okay? But we found out that uh, it was lower cost rather than ease of doing business that actually was a stronger driver. Um, this is particularly relevant, for example, if you look at, in the Philippine case, uh, the price of fuel is one of the indicators of cost. The price of electricity is one of the indicators of cost. And not just talking about our current situation of higher than expected inflation, um, electricity and fuel prices have always been rather high uh, in, in the Philippines. And so that, is, that continues to be a, uh, a, a huge barrier, um, as this data shows. Um, and, and, fi and, and third, uh, sorry, rather than financial costs, what I mean here is operation costs, right? Operational costs of actually running the business rather than the time cost, right, of setting up the new business appears to be a much stronger deterrent to firm creation and entrepreneurship. Okay. Um, and as I said, cost and ease of doing business seems to be an insignificant determinant of business creation in less economically developed municipalities. Not to say that they will not benefit from lower cost and better ease of doing business, but more to say that 
the rest of the economy in that local uh, city or municipality has to be developed further, even before we can rely on cost and ease of doing business to entice firms to come in. Uh, having said that, um, for programs that promote, un so uh, we would recommend uh, promotion of entrepreneurship, uh, sorry, for programs that promote entrepreneurship and firm creation, we think that uh, the focus can be made by looking at individual indicators. Uh, I know that on the one hand, we're saying that it is when you put together overall ease and cost that it has greater impact than if you look at just ease, for example. But in our conversations, for example, with government and small businesses, they say that they understand that it's a systemic matter. We have to cure everything for more firms to be created. But on the ground, that really never happens because we cannot cure everything at the same time. So as a second best, um, perhaps we can look at some of the disaggregation here with regards to which indicators have a positive effect and then still perhaps work on those. Um, however, in the long term, uh, the solutions really are structural, and that might require structural, perhaps even legislative changes. Um, and it's almost like a, 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 an apology or sort of like an understanding at the end, the last bullet point, that, you know, we understand why LGUs will tend to focus on ease of doing business as a common for business, even if this paper says that might not be the best way to entice them, for the simple reason that that, that is perhaps where they have the greatest control. Uh, unfortunately, they have no control over the others. But again, this presents, I suppose, a much larger issue now that can competitiveness at the local level be something which only local government has to worry about? Or is it something that requires more central, national, and deliberate approach? So, thank you. And I have to go. No, I'm kidding. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Eh? Uh, in this session, uh, we, are, uh, we changed uh, some format. So before we move uh, to the next one, uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, some specific questions uh, on the first presentation. The reason is the first one, uh, he deserved to be tortured by some <laughs> critical uh, comments and questions before we forget some details. Uh, <laughs> after two hours, uh, everybody forgets. Uh, and secondly, he has a class at five, uh, so he has to leave uh, earlier. So. Uh, before we uh, leave, uh, before he leaves, uh, we have to do, do our job. And uh, uh, before I invite uh, the discussant to talk about some specific comments on his uh, paper, uh, I'd like to uh, d d d say something. Uh, actually, because I was uh, obsessed with the, the, the ceremony and the, some marketing campaign, I forgot uh, talking about the reasons for our choice, uh, our selection. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, the first one is, uh, as he said, as he explained, uh, uh, we believe that his paper came down a little bit to the ground from the sky. The other papers were, many papers were national level, which is uh, some sense uh, sometimes uh, a bit uh, uh, on, on, <laughs> on, on the sky. <laughs> so uh, he came down to, uh, from the national level to the industrial or business level. That is the one of the uh, rationales <laughs> we uh, made a decision. Secondly, uh, business liveliness uh, is a foundation of uh, any development. Uh, uh, the proposition we cannot deny, as, uh, as far as I understand. Uh, and uh, uh, the third reason, not the reason, but his findings uh, uh, can be applied uh, not only to Philippines, but also to any other uh, ASEAN countries or even at the global level. So that is the, uh, some reasons we uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, reached uh, the consensus. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'd, uh, from the, the discussion, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Leonard uh, Lanjona uh, uh, the, the for to talk, uh, make a comment on his uh, uh, paper and presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here this morning, so I, I missed the discussion. But let me first uh, give some comments. Um, the, the, paper, the paper that was presented talks about the determinants of creating a firm or registering a firm or an enterprise and the role that business regulations play in, in such an undertaking. The, the survey of literature that was noted in the, or that was presented in the paper 
points to business regulations and cost of doing business, ease of doing business, as major constraints in informally establishing a firm. Uh, in the paper, the, the authors discussed a model where an entrepreneur decides whether to set up or, or establish his own enterprise given his labor and his capital. And so he has basically two options, he either sets up his own enterprise given his labor and capital, or he could go into labor employment. In that way, he receives a, a wage. So that was more or less the, the basic framework. So the choice is to be either self-employed, set up an SME, or be a worker, and therefore depend on the gains from such a decision, which, which of course, um, the, the, the decision, of course, is which one would have a greater gain, and also you would, you would avoid the option that would, that would present a higher opportunity cost. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to put a, a little bit of a damper to the celebration about the, <laughs> the price, but uh, I, the, the, the empirical results seem rather counterintuitive, given the framework that they have set up. And it would seem that the ease of doing business, and in, in the third, I mean, in the, in the poorer municipalities, business regulations apparently are not significant and therefore contrary to what is expected. But the, the, ma the major question, I guess, is why would the cost of business lead to a positive result in the number of registrations? I would expect that the higher the cost, the, the lower the number of registrations. So uh, I think this brings to the fore the, the you know, validity of the, of the empirical analysis. Uh, in, in poor countries like the Philippines, most of those who do become self-employed are really poor people who have no other options. So the decision to establish one's own enterprise is really meant for survival. They have no way of being able to enter the labor market, perhaps because they lack the education, perhaps because they lack the skills, or maybe they lack the, the connections. So in effect, the, it is really poverty itself that forces them to try their luck and maybe move them towards you know, registering a small enterprise just so that they can uh, get over you know, the expenses that they have to make on a daily basis. And in effect, it is, um, it is, in effect, it is much easier actually to set up a, your own business than to enter the labor market, which is actually a lot, a lot more uh, difficult for them because of you know, the lack of training and the lack of education and the lack of skills. So the question then is, do regulations still matter? I think the answer is yes, but I think the problem is that the authors were looking at the, the, the wrong types of regulations. I, instead of looking at business regulations, uh, maybe the authors could have looked at labor market regulations regulations that prevent the untrained, the young uh, workers and the unskilled workers to enter the labor market. So I would think that if th they were able to focus more on the enter entry of these workers to the labor market, I think the results would have been, would have been far better, at least based on the studies that I have. I have myself conducted, so, so I think these regulations are, you know, the, the labor market regulations rather than the business regulations are really the key to, crea to creating these SMEs and their effects, um, basically, the idea is that the more regulations that you put on the labor market, then you give the, the individual no other choice but to set up his own in enterprise, just, just so that he could survive. Uh, so in addition, of course, to these labor market regulations, I think the, 
we need in the, in the in the Philippines at least we need the necessary public goods that can help the individuals to uh, obtain more skills and more education and maybe financial assistance and so on. So basically, that's my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, <coughs> before we get the uh, response from the presenter, then I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Joji Manzano. Uh, Joji Manzano, uh, he's not in. He's not, he's not around. Of course, yes. Uh, okay. Then, uh, Dr. Kim Sung Gyu, uh, he thought he's uh, the the pay the. Uh, discussion uh, the pay each paper is uh, the, the allocated for each uh, discussion uh, so as you say one two three one two three so he thought uh, he is uh, uh, making a comment on the first paper to be presented tomorrow uh, <laughs> so he will uh, make uh, the participate tomorrow's session having said that now you have a, a good understanding full understanding how it is organized that means you have a, a comments for three papers tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so now uh, from the uh, other participants, do you have any uh, question or comment? Uh, yeah, the Dr. <coughs> um, uh Thank you very much. Because I really uh, I cannot agree more uh, with the, uh, your comment because that's what I also had that mind about the presentation. But uh, I want I wonder whether when you do this one, because maybe you have some uh, gender variables. Because uh, you know maybe because gender can affect the whole process maybe differently. And then also there are quite a number of uh, research uh, in other countries, especially developing countries, uh, showing that the uh, women have more uh, barriers to entry, not only just entry, but also sustainability of their business. And also I understand also in the Philippines, women have more barriers. And then also there's a study, the data, if I remember correctly, in the case of Philippines, the uh, the the longevity of the the, the 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 business is quite different between men and women. Women have l shorter term to to own and manage their uh, the company. So not only the entrance enter, but also sustainability is also. I wonder whether you can uh, also uh, talk about and the gender dimension. I think it certainly is an important factor. Maybe. Uh, I would love to see the, uh, the the result with the gender dimensions, and uh, uh, yeah. So that it, if if I could just respond okay, yeah. because yeah because uh, so, so there there are two comments about the 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 relationship. Actually, this is my mistake because I wasn't able to clarify earlier. Um, so we had to specify in the paper that in the, in in coming up with the index. By standardizing it, basically what we're saying is that the higher, the higher, the less costly it is, the higher is that standardized score. So a better score means that the cost is actually lower. It's it's not the actual. So so in fact, a higher maximum because we use a, a formula which I failed to put here. It's in the paper actually. So again, that that's probably the primary reason of the confusion. So a higher cost index means actually lower cost indicator values, uh, which is why there is that unexpected result. Of course, that doesn't make sense at all. So I apologize for that, that I didn't put that um, <coughs> up front. Um, I'm OK if the other participants would give some more comments. Right? I just wanted to clarify that first so that we don't completely. Uh, on the others? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I, I'm just taking them. Um, he's my friend, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and, um, just maybe uh, one question is, um, you presented the results for the third to sixth class municipalities, and I'm wondering if the results would be consistent for the first and second class municipalities or and cities. I think that's important because the first and second class municipalities and cities have an industrial base. They yeah. tend to be richer, and I think that's that can be a an explanatory variable that can be captured by, because if they are richer and there's a, an industrial base, then maybe more businesses might be willing to start uh, in those municipalities and cities. 
And in the same line with um, what Dr. Lanzona has presented, um, I think there should be a distinction on the type of firm or new business that's um, captured by your um, dependent variable. Um, I remember um, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, literature would tend to distinguish about what is self-employed and what is a, an entrepreneur. Uh, self-employed tends to be the people who are less educated, uh, who are less educated, um, who would have, who would really rely on their own labor and very few limited capital to start their own firm. And, but I think um, cost of doing business would apply more to an entrepreneur. So uh, maybe the first and second class municipalities are capturing more starting up a self-employed uh, self or people trying to become more self-employed rather than trying to become entrepreneurs or starting their own um, small firms or small businesses. Yes. Any, any other uh, question? Yep. Uh, Thanks very much. That was a very oh, interesting yeah. paper. Um, I guess a, a comment more than anything else. Um, the, the World Bank has been doing a lot of work on um, uh, leading and lagging regions, which, which um, this study seems to fall into. So I'd encourage you to look at uh, what's been done by them. Um, it's been a while since I looked at it, but from memory, they um, did try to look at education levels in, in at a subnational level, and so they would uh, incorporate household income and expenditure survey data in their models. Um, so I think that would certainly be something um, you might like to consider. Um, they also looked at transportation costs um, specifically. Um, a question which is un unrelated to what I just said. Um, you talked, when you began um, speaking, you talked about the importance of the informal sector. Um, how did you incorporate the It wasn't. It wasn't, yeah. It yeah. Wasn't, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure how you could yeah. do that, but yeah. that would be fascinating if you could. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your very innovative and interesting papers. Uh, actually, many of them already cover my talk, but uh, once you talk about the firm's creations, you need to consider uh, the quality of firms but you talk about the productivity level because 10,000 uh, supplier or retail shop rather than just to 10 or 100 you know, technology or high-tech firm would be valued. And also, you also talk about some uh, network or related because already covers some, you know, the city level would be different, you know, uh, enhancing their networking or value chain, so you'd be uh, considered on that uh, matter would be very important indices for the uh, uh, compat competitiveness in index. So you could be more, you know, uh, inputs on the innovation and, and something, uh, what is the real meaning of the uh, competitiveness. So it would be very much, you know, important level to consider and also uh, it will be possible to some qualitative index such as uh, what you already mentioned about some education levels in the labor force also what about the um, uh, patent what they did so something like that would be much more focused how could be in the real competitiveness in that firm's future so that's it. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, four or five uh, 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 comments uh, from the participant, uh, and it's time for you to reply to that. And uh, uh, there is no free lunch, so it's. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, strategically, I had uh, asked someone to bring the uh, certificate out, so we can't <laughs> get it back. But it <laughs> no, but thank you very much, and of course, just a. Uh, uh, a waiver as well. Professor Lanzona was my professor in econometrics, so I'm, I'm sorry, but do not make that clarification. But yes, uh, that was made sure that we have the right science. Um, but I'll begin with uh, the second comment, which is on the motivation for, for, uh, for enterprises. Actually, uh, uh, to be fair, when we look at firm creation, we, we realize that this is a number which doesn't look at very many details at all. For example, 
the registration of a new business permit could be a new business in any sector, agriculture, service industry, of any size, right? And of any intention. So by all means, yes, I admit that, you know, this study was not able to look at that level of detail. We just really looked at, we scratched at the surface. Um, and in fact, this is one of the issues which we also try to delve further in our studies on SME with regards to motivation, for example. Um, I totally agree with uh, like Professor Lanzona's comments and many of the others that um, in developing countries like ours, perhaps the mo we have to differentiate between two kinds of entrepreneurs. One that is opportunity seeking, or we might want to call like a genuine or authentic entrepreneur, although I don't like that term. Um, and entrepreneurs that come out of necessity and therefore they have different motivations. Um, this is a guess. Right, because we don't have enough data. The guess is that you know many maybe of many of these businesses that actually created firms that the captured numbers are opportunity seeking entrepreneurs, because first of all these are entrepreneurs that had registered their business. It's a formal sector entre entrepreneurship, uh, which might mean that there is less likely the 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 an entrepreneur who is here out of necessity. Because many of them, again, this is just guessing it, but you know, many of the entrepreneurs that might come out of necessity will probably be in the informal sector. Okay. And yet again, that has some implications because uh, this, this, this analysis is giving us some, a little bit more idea about how do we increase creation of firms in the formal sector. And we can take it as a reading of that. Um, second. Uh, in terms of uh, yes, uh, in terms of labor market regulations and whatnot, definitely. Um, perhaps uh, in, in in a further version of this paper, we could look more at the entrepreneurs level, because again, although I say this is micro, it's gotten down to the grassroots. It still isn't because we're looking at aggregated data of firm creation, regardless of the kind of entrepreneur. Right. Um, so I would say and admit if this were a dissertation there has a, there was a jump in the theoretical framework and to the <laughs> empirical uh, analysis of it um, but we'll, we'll work on that as well to link it further um, and then in terms of the first and first second tier and the, the third sixth tier um, we did this so so uh, this is where I use my excuse my my co-author um, had actually I remember he had done this as well for the first and second uh, level municipalities but the results were about the same as when you l just looked at cities and so we didn't bother putting it in there um, and also it was uh, yeah yeah that, that was uh, the main reason um, and also we tried to follow the pattern of the CMCI in its uh, it's a lousy excuse but that's we followed their pattern of this aggregation because they also use this kind of aggregation of cities all cities municipalities and third to sixth class um, cities um, but I can imagine that the results might have been what Dr. Kimba had also um, implied. Right? Um, and then type of firms, yeah, um, I think it would really benefit also uh, further analysis if we look at the type of businesses that they enter into, for example, is it agricultural, is it service, is it manufacturing, then maybe for some of them it is cost of doing business, for some it's ease of doing business that's more significant, definitely. I think that's something we can work on, um, but we'd have to get more data with regards to the type of firms being set up. Um, and I also definitely agree we should put mo in more qualitative variables as well. Um, and if this paper is to actually have policy impl implications, I don't think it can pass on its own just looking at the data without looking at the color um, of the reality behind it. So definitely we will do that uh, as we progress. Thank you. Ah, sorry, gender. Yes, definitely. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I no, uh, but I have to update you as well. So actually, in November 14, I, I, I think not all of you would be here. We, we um, the Policy Center for Competitiveness, which I had, um, is uh, uh, is doing a, an SME. Uh, what do you call this? SME conference, and one of the major threads there is actually gender. You will be happy. Um, here we don't have that data. So we cannot input it, but uh, we had conducted um, a like 500, this is our second year of a 500 um, SME firm survey. And gender is beginning to be a very important lens that we can look into, um, especially in the Philippines, especially noting that a uh, majority of our SMEs are in fact women owned uh, and women managed. And we're beginning to realize things as in terms of what kind of investments they make. For example, just to give you some idea, um, the women owned and managed firms in the Philippines, SMEs, tend to invest more in uh, uh, HR development 
um, but were found to be less risk-loving in terms of expanding to new markets. But those are just some initial results. Um, I could perhaps share also with, with the group when there is an email thread the results of that survey that you might be interested in. So thank you. that you didn't apply panel regression. Now your data set, I, I would like to know how many observations did you have uh, since it appears you have 2011 to 2015? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. To be the covered period. So what we did is we actually averaged it out. So for each city, let's say Quezon City, we got the average of the indicator for 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15. So the observations we have now is just really the number of cities that we have currently. Oh, I see. So we got the average. So it's a, yeah. That's why it's not panel, because oh. we just averaged out for the five years. So let's say for 2011, you have, let's say, municipality A, and then B, and so on and so forth. Uh, no, no, what we did is, so what is the indicator value for municipality A in 2011, mm -hmm. in 2012, 13, mm -hmm. 14, 15, then average it out. Um, the rationale also for us in doing that is we think that decisions to open a firm or whatnot might not rely on just the current level of that indicator this year. Uh, it, it, it's a relatively more longer term decision that you might look into. Uh -huh. So for every municipality, uh, he took cognizant of, um, let's say, the ease of, uh, or create, rather, uh, business creation being a function of those two, two things, or two variables, and that you will have five observations for each municipality? Because if that would be so, uh, uh, I think the results would really be affected very much uh, based on the number of observations. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. That's the point. That's why, um, well, of course, there's a limitation on the study because you have only, because statistically, if you have only five for each of these, uh, unless... Not really, because we have looking at the number of cities that we have uh -huh. in municipalities. That alone is already the number of observations you have. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for useful comment and uh, questions. Uh, and uh, if there is uh, no more questions, uh, I, uh, I I take it uh, as a. Uh, uh, you all agree. Uh, he deserves <laughs> the uh, uh, prize. Uh, and uh, I also <laughs> uh, thank you for agreeing on our committee's decision. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Congratulations again. And uh, uh, we have the second presentation uh, by Ms. Wani Jo, uh, the D. La Salle University. Uh, uh, <coughs> the title of the uh, paper is uh, Three for the policy recommendation on technology liberalization in ASEAN countries and the effect on income I inequality. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. There's just so much pressure because um, I'm presenting after someone who uh, won the award. <laughs> but yeah, I'll try my best to um, hopefully give. Still be tired. You won't yeah. Ask <laughs> okay. Um, so I think I sent a PowerPoint file. So hi, uh, my name is Wan Yi Cho. So for those who may ask why my name sounds foreign, where in fact I'm representing the Philippines, I'm actually a Korean by uh, nationality and citizenship, but I grew up here. That's why today um, I'm presenting 
as a Philippine representative and it just so happened or it's a coincidence that uh, the two countries that are very close to my heart you know joined together to come up with this uh, symposium so thank you very much for the opportunity to share my paper and my co-author's paper so uh, my co-author couldn't make it today so in behalf of him and you know our paper I would be the one to present for today so um, I guess unlike some of the papers that were presented today, uh, my paper is mostly focused on policy recommendation. But of course, every policy recommendation has to have a basis on uh, why we came up to that. So before we start, I'll give you some stylized facts that are relevant to my paper, to our paper. So uh, nine out of ten. Currently, there's nine out of ten ASEAN countries that experience high digital and income inequality. So uh, obviously, this is the uh, these are the ASEAN countries except Singapore, since Singapore is uh, known to be a developed country. And this was actually the motivation of our paper because a fact like this hinders uh, us from progressing as one ASEAN. And next, 35%. So currently, there is around approximately 35% smartphone penetration in the ASEAN region, but this is growing rapidly. And this is a relatively low adoption of new technologies, which further distances the technological gap in the ASEAN 10. So if you compare this uh, smartphone penetration to other developed countries, this is uh, relatively uh, low. And the third is 2025. So by the year 2025, uh, study shows that ASEAN has the potential to enter into the top five digital economies in the world. And this also suggests that ASEAN has an extreme potential in progressing through digital inclusiveness. So these all supports a study saying that digital gap is just as extreme and profound as the income gap in many countries around the world. So which is, uh, which is obviously highly evident in the ASEAN, which I, as I showed in the previous slide, we're in nine out of 10 ASEAN countries experience uh, high digital and income inequality. So when there is high uh, digital gap, there's most likely a high income inequality present. So given these, our objective, uh, we, had, we have two objectives. First is to determine the relationship between income and digital inequality, specifically in the ASEAN context. And our second objective was to recommend policies in line with the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025. So like what I mentioned earlier, this paper is a you know, policy recommendation heavy uh, paper. So to empirically prove the relationship between income and digital inequality, we performed a panel data or regression with wage inequality as the dependent variable. So the percent of internet uh, users or the percentage of population with access to internet, GDP per capita, PVP, country dummy variables, and key interactions serve as the independent variables. So for the dependent variable, we have the income inequality, which was measured by the Gini index, uh, wherein the data was readily available in the World Bank. Uh, the, th so here, three econometric strategies, namely pooled OLS, fixed effects, and random effects were used for this study. So of course, uh, we ran the test and uh, we produced robust results. So while the magnitude of the results across the three different uh, econometric techniques uh, minimally varies, they all showed the same statistically significant association that income inequality is negatively associated with uh, internet users. So what does this mean? This means that um, as there is a higher percentage of internet users, uh, there would be lower income inequality. So there's a negative relationship in this. So furthermore, delving into the regression, there was an interesting fact, uh, finding uh, that was reflected by the, interac uh, the interaction between the Philippines and Singapore with the percentage of internet users. So this actually tells us a very interesting reality in the digital economy. So developing uh, countries or developing economies such as the Philippines heavily benefits from the rise in technology and alleviation of income and goods. So these efforts are more seen, the effects are more seen in developing countries, uh, perhaps because the skill premium is not as profound yet as it is in the developed country. So whereas on the other hand, when it comes to developed economy, let's say, for example, uh, the Singapore, alleviation of, so efforts in alleviating digital economy uh, has relatively lesser effect compared to the developing country. So given this relationship, uh, we present to you three different policy recommendations. So this first, 
software literacy, second, accessible public Wi-Fi, and third, trade liberalization. So we emphasize that these policies be implemented chronologically because um, I will further explain why this is the certain order. So the first policy recommendation, it's advancing software literacy through the implementation of basic software education as part of the basic education curriculum or the BEC. So what exactly is software literacy? So researchers define software literacy as the ability to process text documents, browse the web, and use uh, basic application, so which in turn would increase productivity in the long run. So currently, there is a lack of ICT or the information communication technology related courses in public schools with a few ICT initiatives by both private and government towards its development and education. Uh, nevertheless, so different ASEAN countries, uh, for example, the Singapore, have started their efforts and rolled out for technology-related subjects as part of the basic education curriculum. So when we thought about a BEC rollout scheme, we had two things in mind. So the first was the technological skills needed by students on an academic standpoint, and the second was the skills students would need in an industrial standpoint so that these two would complement and produce synergy effect in the long run. So we came up with um, a sample, uh, sample BEC revision in the implementation of software literacy. literacy. So there are three education levels. That's pre-primary, primary, and second, secondary or vocational. So firstly, the pre-primary, these are technically the, the easy, the 101s of using, tec uh, using technology, technology and the devices. So this is basically uh, on how to, how to use basic applications and you know, uh, create, creating, uh, creating or building creativity and abstract reasoning through these uh, readily available app apps that we can easily access. Um, for the primary level, this is basically in the introduction level. So this is also where you learn all the Microsoft offices, such as the Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. So uh, in addition to those readily available uh, platforms, we also integrated a partnership with private sector, wherein these private sectors may opt to may opt to offer elect, uh, electives or programs on certain topics and skills that may be you know, in demand in the real world. And with the secondary or the vocational graduation part of the education level, this is basically all about application, ap applying what you learned previously, uh, you know, acquiring skill set that are in demand. Basically, this is what you will bring to the real world when you, you know, graduate these courses. And this is also introducing the specific uh, role of labor in, in the future. Because nowadays, uh, if we go to, I guess, devel more developed countries, you see all these vending machines. So you know, human, there's, there's this debate between human capital and uh, machines, wherein machines replace uh, human capital now. So you know, some people are losing jobs. So this would help mend that uh, s challenge we have right now due to uh, technological advancements. So what are the main takeaways of this first policy recommendation? This is to uh, increase chances for lower income population to catch up with the modernization. And this is also to pro promote a knowledge-based economy towards an inclusive and sustainable economic growth. And this is also in line with the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025, wherein it would promote a more efficient and productive uh, workforce that is knowledgeable in technology, thus make workers from the ASEAN region much more competent and competitive in the global market. So through this, efforts will be set in place to alleviate um, income inequality. Then now we move on to our second policy recommendation. It's making uh, public Wi-Fi accessible through a public-private public partnership or the PPP. So why utilize PPP when you can just use government funds? So it's because PPPs are extremely common in developing nations to kickstart various massive infrastructure projects. And why make uh, Wi-Fi accessible? It is to increase infrastructure development for ICT initiatives, particularly in rural areas wherein connection is limited. 
This is actually also specifically encouraged in the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025. So it's very much in line. So we have this quote, I guess, in, in implementing this policy recommendation. It's to start small but dream big. So uh, to implement this, we should follow this order starting from middle income, low income, and high income. So why do we have to follow this order? This is to take into account the lag and minimize risk that may arise from starting with heavy subsidies to accommodate low income communities. And uh, we determined that this is the most realistic way to implement this policy recommendation because, it, for example, if you start low income um, communities, it would be very hard because government would right, have, uh, government ha will have to uh, pour out so much budget from the start. Whereas if we start from min middle income, there is there is some time that we can um, adjust depending on the impact evaluation of how the first steps goes. So this is our proposed PPP rollout scheme, wherein there are five phases. So the first is the targeting of areas. This is wherein you coordinate with the LGUs or the local government units and central governments in determining which are the key areas that we should target first. And second is the bidding process. So once the amount has been approved, there will be an yearly bidding process open to both local and international firms. And third is the operation negotiation. So this is where the BOT or the build operate transfer plans negotiations, negotiations wherein the government may allow access to tax incentives to the firms that uh, participate in this PPP. And fourth is the cross checks. This is to ensure that the, the project is in line, is, uh, is producing the key outcomes, is, tar is targeting uh, the initial objectives. So there will be a third party agency that would ensure that there is no uh, mishandling of the project. And the government and the private sector would be allowed to cross check each other's uh, performance or progresses in the said projects. So last but not the least, the phase five would be the impact evaluation. This is to ensure that the project is meeting its expectations and this would also serve as future reference for other PPPs in the futures. And the main takeaway of uh, implementing this policy rec recommendation is that first, it would be a win-win-win situation for the government, private firms, and the citizens. So first, the government, it would be able to gain funds from external sources without having the need to uh, you know, infeasibly increase taxes, yet implement programs that its people need and want. And second, it would be beneficial for the firms because the firms would be able to utilize and maximize their asset in a sustainable investment. And third, for the citizens, of course, it's given. Um, it would be, uh, they would be able to become more productive through a more accessible Wi-Fi system nationwide. And this is very much relevant or interconnected with our first policy recommendation because since you already have the education, now you have the um, accessible Wi-Fi, you can, you can now come up with something you can do to increase productivity. So uh, we have to ensure that our target uh, demographics is prioritized. So we would be implementing this in a, a gradual rollout, focusing on rural areas, then onto a full scale. So these two policies, the, the, base, the BEC and the accessible public Wi-Fi, they account for the micro. Thus, of course, this has to be complemented with a macro policy. So that leads to our third and our last policy recommendation, that's trade liber liberalization through the lowering of technology importations, customs tax, trade barriers on technological goods and telecommunications tax. So currently, especially in the developing countries or the ASEAN setting, there is a presence of higher taxes and fees on technological goods. So taxes and tariffs are approximately at around 8 to 10 percent in ASEAN countries, which cause these uh, tech goods to be more expensive. And because of the price, it makes it relatively uh, more unaffordable for people to purchase these uh, goods. And 
we also made a sample rollout scheme on trade liberalization. And when we made this, we had two things in mind. First was to allow prices to fall in the short run by giving subsidies to tech firms and lowering barriers to entry. And second was to allow prices, uh, prices to normalize in the wrong, long run and force strict sanctions or to monopolies or oligopolies in case there is an abuse of their presence in the market. So this sample rollout scheme on uh, trade liberalization, the phase one is push for inclusivity. Uh, inclusivity. So this is where tax rates on technological goods and services would be lowered to from, let's say, around 4% to 2% or 8% to 4%. And special tech hubs should be present in rural areas and government would give subsidies to these, uh, to these initiatives. And phase two is the stabilization of prices. So once the initial targets have been met, tax rates may be normalized, allowing, in a allowing a return on equilibrium price and quantity. So um, later on, after the prices have been uh, stabilized, they w the government would remove firm subsidies and instead would move these funds to research and development so that uh, these countries would have an easier adaptation of new technologies in the future. And phase three is the setting the condition for the technological space. So this is where uh, we see things more in a wider perspective in the long run, wherein the regulation of monopolies and oligopolies in the technological landscape uh, would be ensured so that market prices would be would be accessible while maintaining its quality. So when we lower trade barriers, we lower prices of technological goods. If prices would be more affordable, of these goods would be more affo affordable, then of course it is given that more people will be able to purchase these products and get to maximize their learnings from the their educational curriculum and you know utilize the utilize the accessible public Wi-Fi. And uh, next is that when there is trade liberalization, both the consumers and the producers would be would benefit from this. Uh, well, for example, nowadays phones don't get designed, manufactured, and distributed at the same country. For example, uh, this product is designed in country A, then it's manufactured in country B, and it's distributed in country C. So if uh, the, the trade barriers would be lowered, then the production costs would further uh, decrease. And this is also the lessen market power of existing oligopolies and monopolies, which is mostly true in developing countries wherein only one or two big players in the, te in the technology landscape are present. So in conclusion, the digital inequality is uh, present in ASEAN and even in the world is just as profound as the income inequality. So this is an issue that has to be addressed in this fast-paced era of uh, development and innovation. So with, uh, with advancing software literacy through uh, BEC, uh, accessible public Wi-Fi through PPP, and last but not least, trade liberalization through lowering trade barriers, all of these policies would, would be an effort to reduce uh, wage inequality in ASEAN by promoting a greater sense of digital inclusiveness. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, I'd like to invite again Dr. Uh, Lanzona uh, for the comment. Uh, <coughs> the, the paper uh, actually talks about the importance of technology, particularly the internet in achieving the goals of you know, development, uh, consistent with, with the CN objectives. And more importantly, it, it seems to offer some empirical evidence that a broader use of the internet reduces wage inequality. Um, I, I just have basically three questions. Now first, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly sure about the, the sample that was used, so are, are we talking about countries or? Or is it just the Philippines? Oh, um, uh, it's different countries. So it's, it's a, it's a cross-country okay. yeah, it's a cross-country cross -country analysis. And therefore, there may be certain, you know, uh, heterogeneity issues involved because countries have certain characteristics that may not be captured by the model. So I'm not so sure how 
how you're able to account for the for the so-called heterogeneity issues. Usually, cross-country uh, cross-country analysis are rather easy to do, and you come up with certain interesting results. But but you sort of miss out on a number of different factors that could come into play, and and that that might create some problems. No? But anyway, at least tr at least try to mention in the paper that you know this is a cross-country analysis. And I, I'm not sure also if, if there were a number of diagnostic tests that were conducted to check the robustness of the results or the validity of the results. Like for instance, I, I, I read a paper and you mentioned that um, ran the random effects results are more, are better than, are, are seen to be, the, you know, the, the better option. No? But but uh, conceptually, it's it's really the fixed effects that are more efficient. So I'm not sure if you did some kind of test to determine if random effects are, are the same as fixed effects, <laughs> and therefore you can use it. Because conceptually, it's really the fixed effects that are really more important. And it's really the way to solve these so-called uh, heterogeneity problems that, that I was talking about earlier. Um, and one last thing, the, the main issue to me never, uh, to me is the, is the empirical specification that, that wage inequality is a function of the proportion of the people who have access to internet, the proportion of ICT importation relative to total imports and market structure. No? It would seem to me that all of these factors are endogenous in the sense that they interact with one another. So it's possible that wage inequality is the one um, causing the lesser proportion of the population <coughs> to have access in the internet. In other words, it can go, it can go both ways. Bo both of them are results. So what I would like to have seen from the model would be factors that are really exogenous that, that would account for wage inequality and at the same time probably how this wage inequality resulted in, I mean how these factors like education, um, maybe access to technology, um, health, how all of these affected wage inequalities and, and presumably they would also be affecting at the same time the uh, access to the to the internet. So, in, in other words, um, it's it's not clear to me whether or not we could we could say that the new technology causes or precedes the wage inequality, because it would seem to me that they are that the that they are uh, simultaneous. No? Wage inequality and access to the internet are simultaneous. And therefore, the paper should account for this simultaneity biases that, that may be that may be found. That, that's all. Thank you very much. Then, uh, yeah, uh, I may add uh, uh, my own question. Uh, the, my question would be a uh, typical one you may have faced or the you may expect. So, in one of the pages, uh, uh, the, the high higher internet use leads to less inequality. Am I correct in yeah. interpreting it? Yes, yes. Then, uh, but I, I think we may say that uh, the more more equality in income leads to higher internet use uh, rather than the other way around. So, I think it is a correlation, but uh, the uh, causal relation. So, what 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 do you think? Um, okay, since uh, both questions <laughs> are very much related, may I address it simultaneously? So um, when it comes to uh, your uh, your comment on the the independent variables, so actually we ran the test first as with the percentage of internet users first, and we account uh, this past the Hausman and the Wilds test. So uh, we did this uh, several tests, and when there was only one independent variable, actually the R squared was relatively low. It was around at 30 to 40 percent, which uh, which is actually very intuitive and understandable because um, it's not only the digital side of the economy that accounts for. Um, inequality of a country, income inequality of a country. So, uh, 
sorry but I, d I, f I forgot to I, I failed to uh, specify that it was a cross-country data in my presentation but it's actually written in the paper and uh, in terms of the overlapping variables so like what I said we ran separate tests first and then we combined it to see association so um, what we were really after was is this uh, is this is the relationship negative or positive so we were after we were more after the relationship than the causal effect of it so we were really after the association of these uh, different variables and uh, to address the second question also uh, like what I presented um, from as from the result of our interactive variables we see that uh, efforts in digital um, inclusiveness, they have a lower effect on developed countries. So which means if it's a developing country, this has a larger bearing than it does uh, when it's from a developed country. So, yeah. May I just comment quickly? I uh, uh, just want to ask, because you use internet user as your indicator for inequality, but actually uh, some of your Proposal policy proposal has includes you know uh, goods, right? Uh, some of the proposal includes goods, and actually, if you talk about the usage of internet or ICT, we usually in ITD, in the, re in the report, they actually talk about ICT use, skills, and of course access. These three elements is usually what what they usually look at if you talk about you know internet use. So uh, to only hinge the entire finding based on internet use, uh, I think it's a bit questionable. And the second thing is I would like more comment about, you know, uh, how trade liberalization, uh, the, the trade liberalization component in your study actually comes in because uh, you say that uh, trade barriers are actually very really high and you, in your policy suggestion, you say that, you no, know, we should lower the tariffs or the tax. Yeah, uh, yeah in tax yeah. levels. Tax levels, uh, it's, it's not tariff, right? Because yeah. I thought under ITA, uh, IT agreement, you know, WTO, all tariffs on uh, ICT goods are actually already very, very low or near zero. So yeah, that is that is my observation. And second thing is like you know to actually address the cross country heterogeneity. Usually, if we talk about ICT in trade, okay, in trade, we have to look at the network effect. Meaning that how do you say um, if your country has a certain level of ICT, let's say achievement and you trade with another country that has a very low level of ICT achievement, trade might not happen because you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the skills, and you don't have the uh, access that you have in the previous country. So what we usually do is we actually look at the levels of countries if you have trade. So that is an indicator. And what we usually do is we do a, uh, how do you say, interaction term with the other countries level of ICT uh, development. There's just a suggestion. But I think the primary issue is you know, how do you actually you know, connect uh, internet use and income inequality. I think the theoretical part has to be much more strengthened. Thank you. And any other comment or uh, question? Yeah, was it two question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, it's a short one. Uh, in your policy recommendations, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that they should be sequential. Yeah. Yes, so you gave three. One, the first is a software literacy. The second one is a provision of a public uh, Wi-Fi. And the third one is trade liberalization. I'm not sure if I can fully agree with you because all three can be uh, pursued at the same time simultaneously. If it's going to be sequential, it really take a long yeah. time before we can achieve that digital nation that we want to, uh, to have. Well, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I agree with you that it's going to take a long time. But uh, what we tried to emphasize was uh, more on the focus of it because obviously uh, we cannot, we have to make sure that the micro policies go together and the macro po policy go together. Because, for example, if we start giving out um, public Wi-Fi first, then you know people might just, for example, end up in and they're playing games or doing some sort of uh, unproductive activity. So that is why uh, we emphasize that the, B, the, the education, the software literacy go first before we actually uh, focus on the public Wi-Fi. So while it 
happens in chronological order, definitely it can come, it can come uh, simultaneously. whether you, you made some tests as to the choice of the model uh, using a cross-country analysis because you, uh, Dr. Lanzon has, uh said that theoretically it's usually the fixed effect model and I agree. Uh, in your case, it's random. No, um, actually we ran three different tests just to see if uh, they are... What the test was that? Um, the pooled OLS, the random effect, and the fixed effect. So we Correct. actually ran all three. Yeah. Oh, but uh, before you could choose one of them, because automatically you're going to have that. Yeah, yeah Now, um, before you could choose which among the three, what did you use? What do you mean? What did I use? Yeah. What test? We ran the um, house mantas and the wild test. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, oh. thank you very much for your the comments. As far as I understand, uh, the, uh, the I find uh, one of the commonalities uh, out of uh, some comments and questions. And if I add, uh, I'd like to see uh, the longer, uh, stronger connection between your findings and the policy recommendations. Uh, so the link is a little bit uh, looks weaker. So there's it looks like a jump. So uh, I think you needed to put uh, more effort on to justify the link between findings, and uh, that that is my uh, understanding from some of the uh, comments. Okay, so now we have to, uh, thank you very much thank for you. your presentation. And uh, yeah, <coughs> we have two presentations and one left. Uh, but however, I think we'd better have a 10 minute break uh, before we go further. And uh, there are some people who ha have to leave uh, now. So, <coughs> so we, we will have a, a 10 minute break then. Uh, when we s uh, start the second part of the second session, uh, we begin with uh, the uh, announcement from our Nepal, uh, the Kathmandu co the University colleague uh, to talk about the uh, next uh, the plan of uh, next uh, event. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. See you on ten minutes. Uh.